So my name is Susie Joukowsky. I work at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and I've worked on coenzyme A, figuring out what it's important for. Uh, uh, it's a, has different uh, priorities in different tissues, and I've been working on coenzyme A metabolism since I first walked in the door at St. Jude in 1980. We started working on it first in bacteria, where I figured out the mechanism of regulation. And uh, then we made the foray through yeast into the mammalian systems. And it's much more complex in mammalian systems. And so we're trying to figure out how that works. And what I'll be talking to you about today is uh, a little bit about what we've been doing in the research side of things, not the therapeutics uh, side of things. I'll be talking about that later because in fact we have uh, two mouse models uh, for PECAN. But as you know, PECAN is caused by mutations in the PANK2 protein. And this is just uh, an illustration of the whole range of mutations that occur. If this, this is the protein sequence here, and all of these circles indicate different mutations that have been identified up, t up until uh, two or three years ago. This data is actually publicly available and from St. Jude. St. Jude put this data together, and it's in the PCAN St. Jude portal, where physicians and you could actually access this data if you wanted to. In this case, PCAN is spelled that way because it stands for pediatric cancer. And it actually started from a pediatric cancer genome project but while they were at it, they decided to map mutations in a lot of other rare diseases as well. <clears throat> so we were fortunate about this. And uh, the bigger circles indicate that those mutations are more prevalent. But depending upon where the mutation is, you get different degrees of severity of the disease because you have different degrees of activity of the protein. Now this protein has a very important role and it initiates coenzyme A biosynthesis in every single organism that we know about, from bacteria up through mammals. In mammals, though, as I mentioned before, it's more complicated. And this is called PANK2 because actually there are two other PANKs in mammals, and that is mouse and humans. That's what I've studied. And uh, there's PANK1, PANK2, and PANK3. Oh, it's just slow. Okay. So as I mentioned, the PANK is right here, and this is a, a this is a uh, an enzyme. It performs a chemical reaction that transfer that transfers a phosphate group to vitamin B5. Panathenate is also vitamin B5, and so the panathenate becomes phosphorylated here. And then, as soon as that happens, there's four more reactions that happen very quickly, and then we form this really important molecule, coenzyme A. And the, the constriction point in the whole synthesis of coenzyme A occurs at this PANK step. And that's what we discovered back in 1980. And the therapy I'll be talking about later today is based on our that initial discovery and what we've learned about how this whole enzyme works to uh, do that reaction. So coenzyme A is a carrier. It's a small molecule that carries virtually all organic acids that come into the cell and it carries them to different reactions. Uh, and it's, it's so it, it sits <coughs> at the, at the middle of practically everything. Proteins are degraded and eventually turned into acetyl-CoA. Carbohydrates, the same thing. Lipids go the same route, fats and lipids. And then the acetyl-CoA forms other CoA derivatives, such as succinyl-CoA. And then these are used to form the building blocks 
that go and make the different components of cells and tissues. So it's involved both in the utilization of the fuels that we need to grow, and it distributes them so that we can perform work and uh, different functions in our body. And every different cell type has a different work function, and CoA plays a slightly different role in all of those cases. We don't know that much about what happens in the brain with coenzyme A, but we are learning more and more. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert, spoiler alert from the research that we've done in one of our mouse models, and that is that succinyl CoA is really depressed when we reduce the coenzyme A levels in mice, and we found that that really impacts brain hemoglobin synthesis. So that's what we've found, and that's the new information that I'll be giving to you today, and it's not, it's not published yet. And this is a workshop. If you have questions, just feel free to raise your hands and, and ask them. So there are three pancakes in mouse brain, and this is their relative distribution. Here's pancake one, pancake two, and pancake three. And this is just measuring the RNA transcripts that are uh, made from the gene, and then that RNA is translated into the protein. So the mutations that are found in the gene directly translate into the protein, the coding sequence of the protein in this case. And in mice, here's PANK2, but PANK1 actually is just as important in brains in mice. And that's different from people. That's one significant difference between mice and humans. In, in humans, brain PANK2, brain PANK2 is really the dominant PANK that we can see. But in this case, um, there's both PANK1 and PANK2 that contribute <coughs> equally to producing CoA in the brain. So when the PANK2 knockout mouse was made, there was really no phenotype. And that's because we have this complex regulatory mechanism where all the different pancakes kind of cover for each other, okay? <coughs> due to their mechanism of regulation. It's a, it's a feedback regulation. And the mice don't have lower CoA in the brain and they don't have a movement disorder. So after we learned that PANK1 was just as important, we made a PANK1 to double knockout mouse. In this case, we deleted the important parts of each of those genes such that they were inactive. And this is a very severe mutation, much more severe than uh, many of the patients would see. Um, but this is the genetic tools that we had at the time. Now, those mice actually died very young because PANK1 is really important in the liver, okay? And through other work that I won't be talking about, we know that PANK1 and coenzyme A uh, abundance is necessary to, main, to maintain glucose levels in the body when uh, during fasting. Okay, so as I said before, each each the CoA has a different job in each of these different organs. Those mice died within two weeks, but actually they had an intermittent movement disorder just before they died. It would come and go. It's kind of transient. It wasn't persistent. It was transient. Similar to some of uh, the patient's uh, 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 characteristics. Um, so we thought we were on the right track. So then what we did next, the next easiest thing to do, we made a systemic PANK1 knockout because that was a relatively mild phenotype and combined it with PANK2 just deleted in the brain. Uh, and we did some genetic tricks to achieve that mouse. So that mouse lived longer, and I'm going to call it mouse model number one. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and we actually, uh, were, it, mice lived long enough to develop a phenotype and a movement disorder that we can uh, see.
just to show you in the brains of these knockout mice, we actually proved that we actually lowered the amount of, of PANK2 protein in the brain. Uh, this is a what you would call an immunoblot. We take all the proteins, we separate them on the basis of charge and size by electrophoresis, so we can you know, splay them out and see individual proteins. And then we take an antibody that specific, specifically recognizes the pancase that we've developed in our lab to actually signal the amount of panK2 that we see in each sample. So in the wild type mice, you can see that PANK1 alpha, PANK2, and actually we know from other data that this is PANK3, they, um, they are expressed, all three are expressed in the, in the wild type mouse brain. But in the one, two, double knockout that I just described, you can see that the PANK2 is virtually absent. It's not completely absent because we just knocked it out in neurons. That isn't to say that those are the only cells that are affected, but we know that they definitely are a target. Okay? But the accessory cells that support the neurons are also important, I believe. But in this case, we just knocked it out in neurons. And this is a PANK2 specific antibody. And um, this residual signal is contributed by the other accessory cells in the, in the body, like glial cells and astrocytes, that support the normal function. But anyway, you can quantitate these, uh, these immunoblots, and this is the difference in the level of expression of PANK2 in the brain in this mouse model. Okay, so this mouse lives a little bit longer um, it actually uh, makes it, uh, well, the median lifespan is actually 17 days. Some mice make it out to 21 or 22 days. That's not very long, but it's long enough to uh, display a phenotype. The mouse, the, the knockout mice are shown in red, and they're compared to their matched litter mates, which are wild type. And these are shown, no. The knockout mouse is in black, and the wild-type mice are in red. And you can see that at about day 15, the knockout mice begin to lose weight, and they start to have difficulty, and they start to separate their behavior from their wild-type litter mates. And what they actually start to show, starting about day 15 to 17, is a forelimb or forepaw flexing, dystonia-like flexing in their paws. You, this is a, a blow-up model of the, of the uh, animals. They really, they don't have any grip strength remaining in their forelimbs. And you can measure this with a little mouse finger. It's really cute. <laughs> and uh, then, and this actually, I picked up on the fact this resembles a lot of what we see in the pecan patients. This was from a newsletter back in, oh, 2015, 2016, where um, you could actually see the, these, uh, the same type of uh, dystonia-like uh, uh, deformity that develops. And I have a little uh, movie. So what happens is, the mouse just, the mouse scoots around. It, it kind of scoots on its elbows and goes around and can't use its forepaws very well. And you can kind of see that in the, in the model here if the guy turns around. And his, his forelimbs are, are I can repeat that if you want. Um, but then we measure this, actually, we can actually videotape the movement of the mice, and it's shown in the next panel here. The, um, this is where we put the mouse in a small arena, maybe one and a half feet by two feet, and we measure how they move over a five-minute period. 
And the green dot shows where it starts, and the red dot shows where it stops at the end of five minutes, and actually quantify the amount of time that they're moving and uh, the, the distance that they've, they've moved. But a, a picture's worth a thousand words. So here's three wild-type mice that go through this, uh, this arena challenge. And these are the knockout mice. And you can see that they really have trouble moving around because they just have to scoot around all the time. So what we did was, but before that time, they don't show this phenotype. Um, they don't show the phenotype here uh, at day 9 through 12, but they develop it in this intervening period between then and then the time that they eventually die. We have the weight loss that you saw on that graph and this forelimb dystonia, and that's when this, this whole phenotype develops. So to look at what's happening on a molecular level, we sampled the brains of the mice both before and after the development of the phenotype. And I'm going to tell you about what we found. So in these mice, this is the early time point here, wild type and knockout. And this is the later time point, wild type and knockout. And this is where we actually measure the CoA levels in the brain. And you can see that the wild type and knockout have the same CoA levels at the early time point. But at the later time point, the CoA levels increase. It's part of their developmental program. But in the mice with the PANK2 deletion, the CoA does not increase. It remains the same. And this is why they're going into crisis. So it, does, it is related to the level of coenzyme A in the brain. And this, we've done the measurements, well, in the front of the brain, which is primarily the cerebrum, and the back of the brain, which is primarily the cerebellum. Yes? Would you not call this the atypical? Instead of the classical people? Oh, sorry. I, I'd say it's more like the, uh, the classical, because we have a complete knockout complete inactivation of the gene, and this is a very severe phenotype. I was thinking because it starts, starts like after day, day 12, and, and it's not there from a very early, early start? Well, it's not there very early, early in the humans, probably, either. Right. It doesn't show up till age two or three. Not always. Six months yeah. is the youngest. Uh, oh, really? Classical. Okay. But yeah, six months is the youngest that classical humans can diagnose. Uh, of course. Of course. Yes. Really? Okay. Well, those are the very severe cases, and this would be a very severe case as it's... These, these mice are still in development. They, they're still feeding off the mom. So mice are still with their mom. They're not even being... Um, what do you call them? Um, Weaning. Weaned. By no, they haven't been weaned off by mothers. Three weeks. So this is like tiny, tiny mice. They're very young. Average lifespan of the mouse. Two it's years. years. Two years. So this is like Two years. Two years is the average life lifespan of a mouse. Yes. I'll also say with mice that some of them, there are still parts of them that are developing after they're birthed out of the mom, where with humans we're fairly well developed when we come out, but mice still have development that happens. So trying to equate like a 10 day old mouse with 10 day old humans. And Adam, probably <coughs> speaking, is quite good at that. So, uh, yeah. How many days? Uh, would you say is a, a teenage mouse compared three to a teenage human? Three months. So. No, that's adult is three months. <laughs> Up to three months is teenage. Eight, I'd say eight weeks is teenage. You can start breeding at eight weeks. We do. Well, yes. I would say still, regardless, a, a young mouse like this at the early stages is still a very... This is severe. This is a very severe. Very severe. Worse than classical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more questions on the back? Um, also, can you explain the wild type as it would relate to the human population? Without PCAM mutation. No, no, like Pine why? So, so just to help uh, people who don't have a scientific background understand this a little better, when you're looking at p-values, you want it to be less than 0 0.05. 
If it is above 0 0.05, it's not significant. There's no difference. And when you're talking about animals and wild type, that means a normal person, what you would see in someone without the mutation. So it, it kind of be the equivalent of having a normal placebo kind of control, but not affected. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please interrupt if you don't understand. It's, uh, um, I don't usually talk to this type of audience and appreciate the patience. Um, so anyway, we've reduced the CoA in the brain in a, in a, in a later in development. Sure, what? <laughs> well, we have to be 20 minutes for the speaker. Okay. Uh, if you could wrap it up in about five or seven minutes. Sure. Thank you. Anyway, it's not only the, the total CoA that's reduced, but you, we've measured, as I mentioned before in the earlier slide, acetyl CoA is reduced. This is in males and females. We've separated them out in this case. As far as total CoA is concerned, there's really no difference, but there is a difference when you uh, uh, between males and females when you look at the CoA derivatives. And then here's the difference in the succinyl CoA that is really reduced uh, more than 50 percent. And then we did a global gene analysis of the brains before and after the development of the phenotype, and this is just some computer. Uh, evidence that shows you we, we looked at a lot, a lot of genes and really at the earlier time point, both, both males and females, there was practically no difference in the, that you can see in the black here between the normal and the knockout mice. But at the later time point, all these red dots show that there are a lot of differences. And so when we filter out differences due to sex or other parameters, there were only about 10 genes that really s stood out as being different in the later time point. And those genes, actually one set of genes plus the ACL-CoA distributions pointed out that it's hemoglobin synthesis in the brain that's probably really down when they developed the phenotype in the mouse. The succinyl CoA we've measured is down more than 50%. The next enzyme that controls this whole pathway, uh, amino limulonic acid synthase, sorry about that, alas, I'll call it that, uh, that is responsible for making heme, which actually chelates iron. This is the prosthetic group for hemoglobin, and it controls the expression of the protein part of hemoglobin here. And these, these genes are down quite a bit um, in the brain as well, the double knockout mice. They, these are the, that make the alpha and beta chains of the hemoglobin. And all together, we would expect to see a large um, deficit in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen, and this is consistent with some of the pathology that's been found in some of the pecan uh, brains post-mortem, where there's a lot of ischemic-like infarcts that are found in the basal ganglia, which would uh, indicate uh, uh, oxygen or glucose deprivation. So, that's it. These are a variety of people, all the people in my lab who uh, contributed to this research through the years. And this has been supported by St. Jude, um, NIH, uh, with two grants from NIH. And uh, uh, most recently, we've been working with a company, uh, Coway Therapeutics, and I believe you were introduced to them yesterday. And we'll be talking about the therapeutics. We're working on therapeutics with Coway. And, um, I'll be talking about that later today. So, that's it. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Dr. L'Oreal Early. I am a postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and I have been working in gene therapy for the last eight years, um, including my graduate work. So I know a lot about gene therapy. I know a lot about the vectors for gene therapy. I know very little about PCAN. So I, this is all new for me, and I really appreciate everyone <coughs> inviting me here to talk about gene therapy and helping me learn more about the disease and you know, getting to know everyone here has been really special for me. Um, this is actually my first time talking to non-scientists, so I will try to keep it simple, and if I'm saying anything to you that makes no sense, please stop me and let me know that I'm using jargony science words that you don't understand. So, um, and I would say, so we've been working on developing this pecan treatment for about uh, three months, so there's not a lot of hard data to report. But instead, I'd like to just give you a general overview of what gene therapy is and how it works. Um, so you're going to hear a lot. I mean, probably in the news, you hear a lot about it these days because it's become kind of in vogue. In addition to what I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to just plug my own professional society. Um, so I'm a member of the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. On our website, under ASGCT.org slash education, we've recently put up some resources for patient population groups. Um, so there's a Gene Therapy 101 and specific disease treatments. Um, these are obviously going to be different rare diseases um, than what you have, but they're up there. And then these Gene Therapy Basics, different approaches. Um, these are little videos that are put together to help everyone understand what gene therapy is, so feel free to use those. And actually, I'm going to ask you if, you, if you watch these, and then if you have comments about how you thought they could be better or things you can understand, if you can email me, which my contact info is in your packets, I also have business cards, it'd be great, because I'm on the outreach committee, and we're trying to get feedback on, on whether this is helpful for people. Um, we also have a clinical trials finder, which you can find on our website. Obviously, there aren't any clinical trials for PCAN for gene therapy yet, but I just thought I'd put this resource out there in case other people in the rare disease community are interested. Um, and if you go down to, all the way down here, unfortunately, it's like uh, kind of hard to find right now because of Google, but uh, maybe I can't even find it, actually. But anyway, kind of, anyway, it exists, and it's very easy to use um, when you can actually find it. It's got a weird URL. Um, and then you can come in here to all therapeutic areas, and you can look up things like neurodegenerative disorders, and then go under select modalities, and then you can look under viral vectors. And what I work on is viral vectors, but you can see there are different types there. There's a cell therapy, and there's you know, stem cell therapies and viral vectors. So if you're also ever just curious to see what's going on in the world of gene therapy and what ways we're treating people and what clinical trials are currently open, this is a nice resource as well. So. That's me plugging my community, um, and now I'll get to your community. Um, so there's lots of different types of gene therapies that you may have been hearing buzzwords about. This is Iceland. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, so there's ex vivo and there's in vivo gene therapies. Um, ex vivo means we're taking cells out of a patient, we're treating them in a culture dish, to modify the genetic code and then putting it back into the patient. Um, and this can be done with naked DNA, which we call plasmids. These are circular pieces of DNA that are easy to work with in a laboratory. We use them a lot for um, our work. And the, yeah, it's just tiny pieces of circular DNA. Um, we also use viral vectors. And the difference between a viral vector and a virus mm -hmm. is that a virus, usually we're talking about kind of the virus we would find naturally occurring that you might be infected with, it can carry disease. With a vector, what we've done is taken that virus and removed all the genes that might cause harm. And we've hollowed that virus out to where now it's something we can use as a transport vehicle to deliver therapeutic genes to a patient. So when I say vector, that's what I mean. Not, not as in vector for disease, like bats or rats or something like that. So don't, don't be alarmed. Um, and there are a couple of different viruses that are commonly used these days for this work, um, lentivirus, adenovirus, and AAV, which is adeno-associated virus. It's not adenovirus. Um, that's an important distinction. So also, um, there's in vivo, and this is what we would look at for PCAN. This is treating cells in a person. So we would actually deliver the viral vector to the person. You can also try to do this with naked DNA. This would be, um, if we could get this into cells, it'd be better in many ways, but we do not have the technology right now to really get DNA directly into the cell without some kind of vehicle to get it there. 
because turns out your cells just don't like taking up random DNA from the environment, which is probably for the best, right? So, um, and so for viral vectors, traditionally in, in people now are using things like adenovirus and AAV as opposed to something like lenti, and that's based on the nature of the virus. So lenti virus is what's called an integrating virus. It will actually insert its genome into your genome and make itself part of your DNA, which means that that change is permanent. It will follow all of the cells through division, which in theory would be great because then all of the cells forever will be corrected. The problem is if it inserts into the wrong place, it can cause cancer. And I know Dr. Strauss gave a really good talk yesterday, if any of you caught it. And that is what happened in one of the early clinical trials using, um, not lenti, but a similar virus that inserts into the DNA. So usually in people, when we're doing directly now, we try to go with viruses that don't insert into the DNA, and they exist outside of your own DNA, but still in the cell. And I'll get into that a little bit further on. So that's what would be an integrating would be lenti. Non-integrating is something like adenovirus or AAB. There's also gene editing tools you've heard about, like CRISPR, um, and I don't work with CRISPR specifically. Um, the thing is, if we ever do use CRISPR, we're also going to have to deliver it, and the vehicle of choice for delivering CRISPR is AAV. So we're just going to talk about AAV. It's my favorite virus. So, um, so the AAV is the non-integrating. All right, so I want to show you a picture of what AAV looks like, because I find that it's much easier for people to visualize and retain information. If you can picture, What's a virus look like? And most people have no idea what a virus actually looks like. So this is a picture of AAV, and this is really, really small. This is taken with an electron microscope, and you can see it's kind of this um, poly, like polygon shape. It's an icosahedral symmetry virus, and so when we blow it up, and it looks a lot like this, um, is this is our representation on a computer of what this actually looks like. But this is when, so you know what AAV looks like. Um, and what we can do is inside the virus, you have the AAV genome. And this is a very small genome. It only has two genes in it. We can just remove those two genes and put in the gene for PANK2. And now you have this delivery vehicle that's a virus that contains, instead of its viral DNA, DNA the DNA for PANK2. <clears throat> Um, and we can make this in lab by using cells. So cells become our replication factors for a virus. Much like viruses do to your own cells, they enter your cells and then trick the cell into making a lot more virus. We're doing the same thing. Um, we're just making sure that the viruses are packaged with the DNA we are, that we want, like the PANK2 DNA. So we can take all of the genes necessary to do that. So we have our PANK2 gene. We, we put in the genes that are necessary to replicate the viral genome that's now the vector genome, and also this, um, these proteins that form what's called a capsid. And the capsid of a virus is just this external protein shell, and we just call that a capsid. So we put the genes for that in there, and then also AAV um, actually can't replicate on its own. In some ways, it's a terrible virus because it actually doesn't cause, in the wild, doesn't cause any disease. It can't replicate on its own. It's pretty passive and it only can replicate in the presence of a, what's called a helper virus. And why, the reason it's called adeno-associated virus is because adenovirus is its main helper. So most people who get infected with AAV only do so in the context of also having a, an adenovirus infection. Um, so that's one of the reasons actually we really like AAV too, is because it's quite safe, um, you know, because it doesn't really do much all by itself. Uh, so we have to put those genes in there too. And then we put them into cells, um, we call these 293 cells. And um, then a couple days later, all this virus is made. We can harvest that out and purify it. And then we have a, a whole population of these viral capsid shells that can transport the PANK2 gene into a patient or cells in a dish or mice, wherever we're going to put it. So to get you an idea of what this kind of looks like, so this is my very high-tech animation of AAV infecting a cell. So here we have our little AAV vector. It's got the PANK in it. And here's our cell with like a Cells have a plasma membrane that's like a fatty membrane that holds everything inside the cell. So for a virus to you know, do gene therapy, it has to get into the nucleus of the cell where all of your DNA is. And so to get there, it has to enter into the cell through the plasma membrane, go across all the cytoplasm, get into the nucleus, and then this whole virus uncoats so that just the genome is left. So in the case of AAV, this genome forms a small circle, much like the plasma that I was just talking about, and it exists outside of your chromosome. So it never integrates, it just kind of hangs out here in the nucleus, which is great for us in some ways, because it means that we don't have to worry about it integrating and possibly causing cancer, but it also means that this treatment only works in cells that don't divide, because if the cell divides, this gets lost. The cell will retain all of the chromosomal DNA, but it loses anything that's not attached. 
Um, so for, but for gene therapy of the brain, this is fine because your neurons do not divide. I mean, everything I say is a caveat, but for the most part, they don't divide. But it would be not good to treat something like your blood, where your blood is constantly being renewed. So when people are doing the sickle cell treatments, that's why they're removing your blood cells, integrating a virus into that genome, putting them back in, so that way when the cell divides, the DNA is still there. Hopefully this is all making sense. So like I said, if I'm, if I'm being confusing, please stop me. All right, so why am I showing you this? So we have to get the virus to the place we want it to get to. And so for PANG, or sorry, PECAN, um, I'm pretty excited about that it seems like the, only, the major pathology comes in a small region of the brain, brain called the globus pallidus. So this gives us an opportunity to directly deliver the virus to the brain, which I know sounds like crazy sci-fi, um, but this has been done multiple times, and it seems very safe. Um, and so you can actually use MRI-guided technology to insert a catheter into the brain and directly inject the virus. And this technology has actually already all been worked out for like deep brain stimulation. So people have been doing this for a long time. So like I said, I know this sounds crazy high tech, but this is actually fairly safe and it's been done multiple times in clinical trials. So, and this is just an image of that, so you can use contrast a little bit to make sure you're getting to the right location. All right, so um, this is not Hank. This is um, me, in, I've injected a mouse brain directly with a, a virus that's an AE virus. In this case, the virus is harboring the, um, the gene for a green fluorescent protein, and we use this because um, it's green and we can see it quite easily. So if I then inject the mice and I wait for the virus to express, I can then slice the brain and see where the virus got to. And in this case, this red region here is the globus pallidus region of the mouse brain. So we can see that um, we can get virus to that area and also um, the areas around it. So uh, we're hoping that for our testing purposes, when I make this virus, I can inject it into a mouse brain right into the globus pallidus and then see if that corrects the phenotype we see in the mouse. So see if it fixes the disease we see in mice that have pecan. To look at this a little bit further, this is not a mouse I injected, this is a coworker, and again, it's with GFP, but we can now see that, I just wanted to show you what this really looks like in the brain. All of these green cells here, all of these neurons have, are expressing green fluorescent protein. So um, if we were doing this with PANK, then all of these cells would also be expressing um, P, or the PANK2 gene. And then we can also identify what cell types um, have been uh, what we call transduced, so what cells are actually expressing the protein. Um, this staining is, um, these, all these red cells are neurons, and we can do that because we have fluorescent markers that can identify specific proteins associated with neurons. So everything that's red is a neuron. Everything that's green is where an AAV virus with the GFP in it got into the cell. And if we overlay them, we can see that most of those neurons are now expressing GFP. So that's just in the, an example. So where are we now? Um, so right now I have the PANK2 gene and it's put into this plasmid and that was necessary to make the virus. So we have it in plasmids. Um, we can transfect cells these plasmids. And what this means is that when I, instead of using a virus to infect a cell to put the, to get the um, PANK2 gene in there, we can, in the culture dish, we can transfect. It's a faster way of getting stuff into cells. We can't do it in people, most, mostly. Um, but we can use the naked D to get in there. So if we do that, um, I found that if I put that coding sequence in there, it can make PANG2, the localization seems correct. I've made virus, and we've found that, that you know, this can be packaged in the virus. So right now I have virus, it's got the PANG2 DNA in it, and when I get back to lab next week, I'll be infecting cells with it and making sure that they're making the protein correctly and that it's localized correctly. And then from there we can inject mice. Um, so. So the next plan will actually be, um, oh yeah, sorry, I, I remember my study now. So I was gonna show you what this looks like when I transfect a cell, where right, this is just the naked DNA that goes in without the virus. Um, but we can see here that we have um, a fluorescent protein that can recognize the PANK2, and we can see that here. I also, um, I did a little science trick because we weren't sure if we'd be able to recognize it with this type of um, protein. Um, I added a little tag that's called a flag tag. Um, this is a molecular biology technique, but it's just a way of marking a protein to say, okay, I really wanna know that this protein is what I'm working with, so I'm gonna add this flag tag to it, and that allows me to identify it. So the fact that we have like the, you can see here this, you know, this green color marking PANK2, this purple color marking PANK, or sorry, flag, when they overlap like that, it makes me confident to say that this protein here is what we're trying to look for. So this actually is the PANK2 protein in cells. Um, 
And so that was kind of a nice marker to say that, yeah, we're able to recognize where our protein is at. So what's next? So we're going to make sure the virus is infectious. Um, I'm going to use it to infect patient cell lines. Thank you, everyone who's donated cell lines for cells for um, science. This helps a lot. So we're going to infect your cells with these. Um, make sure that type 2 is being made. Um, we'll also confirm localization. So the next thing I want to do is inject um, wild type mice, like normal mice, and we're going to inject them with the um, virus that makes the PANK2 and make sure that there's no negative phenotype because we don't know if overexpressing this could cause problems. And what we don't want to do is put this into people and give you too much PANK2 and that might cause some other problems. So we want to make sure that this is safe. Um, and then after we confirm, like, that hopefully that it doesn't hurt mice, we can then inject pank mice and see if that actually, or pecan mice, and see if that fixes the phenotype. There was my Gene Therapy 101, so if you have questions, please ask them. Yes? Okay, you mentioned that when they merge, you're looking for it to change the, it changes the phenotype. Oh, oh, uh, sorry, here? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that yeah, this is really we want cool. the genotype to be changed, don't we? The actual, so um, the new future, new cells will reproduce the new. So thankfully with neurons, um, they don't divide. So once this DNA from the virus is in the nucleus, it will stay there forever, as long as they don't divide. So okay. this is not changing your genotype, as in you'll still, like people who have pecan, will still have two not working copies of PANK2, but then now you'll have a third working copy. And that is where all of the protein will come from. Um, I'm not familiar. I know that the, the brain cells do reproduce at least like 20 years or something like that, correct? There is some neuronal division. It's very limited. What about the children? Right? Oh, after you're, no, it's after you're, if you're a child, it's, you've got all your neurons. You're fine. So you're not, I'm sorry. Well, oh, sorry. A child, aren't, aren't you still making brain cells or are they, they're born with them? Pretty much. As far as, I mean, someone, if someone's a neurologist, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that. You're pretty much, once you are developed, that's wrong, you got them all. And at that point, what you're doing to um, grow is that you're actually changing your connections between your neurons. So again, if anyone's a neurologist. Okay. okay. <laughs> so unlike, for example, the SNA example that we heard about from the keynote yesterday, this therapy, if, if it works and goes forward, would be available <coughs> to anyone of any age with the I, I can't say because yeah, that's the determination by the FDA. So yeah, let's talk about who could get this therapy. Oh, and actually, I meant to even say this in the beginning. I apologize because probably the number number one question is when, and that would be no less than five years for sure. But five to fifteen. What I've seen in other parts of the field for neuronal gene therapies is it's about eight to ten. So just keep that. It's all very early, and we are working as fast as we can. But it is a slower process. So who can get this therapy? So there's a couple things about that. One is that, um, again, this isn't a cure, and we can only, this therapy can really only halt progression. It might help symptoms that are already present if those symptoms are caused by things dysregulated, but it can't bring back cells that are dead or are too far gone. So ideally, we're treating as young as possible, um, and that's one of the reasons I think they do the SMA. A, because the SMA type 1 is devastating, and if you were to try to treat too late, it won't have very good therapeutic effect. So if you look at the SMA data, um, infants you treated at like one or two months did very well. Infants treated at 18 months, it helped, but it was not as good of a rescue. Um, and you'd see the same thing here. So the other thing, so obviously earlier is better, and I can't make the determination right now how early that is going to be, and that's several years out. And that would be something we'd have to work out what we see both clinically and also with the FDA. Um, and I've also heard, so. With the FDA, um, I'm going to say right now that they are really enthusiastic about gene therapy, and they are, they've already expanded their CBER office. We go through the biologics division to get these things approved, and they are hiring 50 new reviewers. They're very enthusiastic. The NIH is very enthusiastic. So there's a lot of, of regulatory push, actually, that helps, um, that might help cut up through some of the red tape we have to deal with for FDA. So that is encouraging for us. Um, the other thing I should mention is that because we're using a virus, the immune system can be a problem in that many people in this room may have already been infected with an AEV type 2. That's a very common human virus that people get when they're 2 or 3. You'll never know it because it doesn't cause disease. 
Um, the one we're going to look at is an AB type 9. It's slightly different. It's kind of the one everyone uses for brains. It's the one being used in the SMA trial, or that, that's not approved. I can't say trial anymore. It's not an approved therapy. Um, and that's not as common. But if someone were to have been exposed to AAB9 naturally and had very high antibodies against it, we can't give them the virus because all of your antibodies would just glom onto it and destroy it the way your immune system is supposed to work. Um, there are ways people are trying to work around that. Um, and actually one of the nice things about a direct brain injection is that it can help bypass some of those antibody responses because if you do it systemically, that's where most of your antibodies are. Um, like if you inject into your veins, there's a lot of antibodies you have in your blood that are constantly circulating trying to prevent you from getting a disease. The brain is considered more immune privileged. It's not that there is no immune system, there is, but it's um, there are, there's less of an antibody response in the brain, and people have shown that in monkeys, even if they have if they have antibodies, but they're at a low amount, you can still get good um, results in the brain. If they're a high, if they're like a really high amount, then you can't. But um, if they're low, it's, it's an easier way to bypass it. Uh, yes. Um, what's the phenotype you're going to be looking at to correct? So that's worked with. Um, the Hayflick lab, and they have a paper coming out on that pretty soon. Can you tell me what it is? I can not, because it's not my work. But if you want to talk to Sue or Susan about it, I, I would recommend that. So they, they are very hush with me about it, too. So. <laughs> but yeah, they have a phenotype that they've been able to show that they can correct. So I would uh, just add that uh, in terms of the time frame, the advantage of using AAV9 is that it's being used for other disorders. And so the safety and efficacy of it in other patients will actually facilitate the timeline for approval through the FDA. So it's possible that the timeline could even be shorter uh, because it's been used for other disorders. If it's approved for those other disorders as it is for SMA, uh, that may make it easier to get done. Um, and this is one of the reasons that it's so important to understand and support other research across the various diseases, whether they're MBIA disorders or not, because in the end, that helps with all of the various ones. Absolutely. So um, this work has been going on in a lot of various communities. So the first people we treated with this were cystic fibrosis patients, which unfortunately, the gene therapy for cystic fibrosis still is not um, for different complications the way cystic fibrosis works, we haven't been able to do that. But So this has been the work in a lot of communities like your own. And I'll just say that um, it is really important. Um, they have a trial right now for gi um, giant axonal neuropathies that was entirely founded by, fa by foundation groups, by fundraising efforts. And so everyone out there is working on this, and I think that it's very exciting that we start to have these treatments for rare diseases that we weren't able to do even just 20 years ago. Um, and yes, Dr. Strauss is right. So we know that AAV itself is quite safe. Um, there have not been any severe reactions to the virus itself. The concern with the FDA would be, is this particular protein overexpression going to be safe? So if we, because it's hard to, it's hard in the way in our work to make the right the expression of the protein, like how much protein you make is different depending on the cell type, is different again, depending on where you are in the body, and it's hard to mimic that in a in a viral vector, especially with the limited space we have. Like I said, AV is very, very small, and um, we can only put 4,000, 4, about 4,700 nucleotides into that, which may, may not mean much to you, but it's very, very small. So there's not a lot of room to put natural regulation into it. So a lot of what people end up doing is just say, okay, we're gonna put in either A, a promoter that, um, sorry, a way to make the, the protein turn on everywhere, or we can do it in specific cell types, but it's hard to control how much we make. And so we usually end up making more than what the cell would normally make. And that's one of the, the things the FDA will want to know is, is it safe to do that with this particular protein? Is gene therapy okay if with this kid? Sorry, is it if gene therapy with this kid? Is it okay for adults or just kids? Is that so, right, Mike? Yeah. yeah, so it would be, um, again, if we had an adult that had, um, that was not particularly progressed in their disease, then that would be a candidate. If someone was very progressed in their disease, it would depend on how progressed they were because, again, we can't 
fix something that's already very, like very down a disease pathway. So it would probably depend individually on the patient would be my guess. But certainly we have put gene therapy in adults and in one month old infants. So people are also pursuing this for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all of that. So there's nothing about the virus or the therapy directly that dictates age. It's, I think, more about the disease. And I think Dr. Strauss might want to comment yeah, as well. I just add two points. One is um, the, the problem with older patients is uh, potentially antibodies to the virus. Yes, yes. Uh, so the older you are, the more likely you are to have had that infection previously. And that may, may make it more difficult. To the second point is one that I think personally is very important. We don't know how reversible some of the symptoms are. We know that if you have dead neurons, they can't regenerate very well, but we don't know how reversible some of the phenotypes are, and, and at least in one disorder that I know about, people were absolutely astounded at how reversible it was. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, it may not be reversible. So. I think that's one of the reasons that the trials have to be done and done in different ages if they can be done safely um, to see what changes can be reversed. I would say with this, um, with PCAN and with gene therapy, there's just so many unknowns right now that we can guess from other trials, but everybody, they, every disease is going to be a bit individualistic. And so um, we'll all find that out together as we work through this. Okay, so I, I think a question that's on a lot of our minds is with the deferoprone that we learned about yesterday and the iron chelating and then all of the, the Coise like trials, how are those two related? Are they doing the same thing? You know, how, how does all of that work? So, and I know you're not a deferoprone person. I, I'm not. <laughs> um, so from what I understand about the deferoprone, it's an, uh, to remove the iron. So this would be, so this therapy would not be trying to address iron directly. We're trying to directly address what's probably causing the iron accumulation. Um, honestly, I really wish it was just the iron because then we could do a gene therapy like, oh, we'll just upregulate an iron exporter, you know, and we could like maybe treat all these diseases. But I, that doesn't seem to be, unfortunately, the way that we can approach that problem. Could you flip back a couple slides where you have the pathway? Oh, I don't have the pathway up here. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, I have it somewhere in my thing. But yeah, so um, in the, if you can remember back to um, Dr. Kelsey's talk, uh, when we're looking at that slide of the pathway of how these how coenzyme A is produced in the, in the body, this would be the directly trying to affect the very upstream thing that's broken. Um, and so it hopefully would fix both um, the, the coenzyme A production and hopefully not allow iron accumulation. Um, does, that, does that help? I hope. Does that help? You guys have... I've been talking a lot with you, and it's a question I'm hearing over and over: is how is the Veraprone and CoAZ different? Why why are people talking about them working together? Um, how is it that you know the iron is the iron the problem? Is something else the problem? I think yeah. I think the CoA is the cause, yes. and the iron is the effect. So. Uh, if this will help. Uh, here's a little pathway picture. So um, here is where your panks are working. Or your, uh, so this is where your panks one, two, and three are working to phosphorylate this vitamin, and that is the beginning of this pathway where there's many other modifications that have to happen um, to produce this coenzyme A. So if you break it up here, then none of these things can do their job. And there are ways to, to try to get around that. So if you're trying to add coenzyme A, you know, and this pathway is broken, you can just add, you can just try to add coenzyme A. Like you can just synthesize it and put it in. And I believe that's how the coez is trying to work. Um, the iron pathway is separate from this. So that would be what I think people now are, are thinking. My impression is that it's um, a byproduct of things going badly in cells. 
Um, and you can see this in other neurological diseases as well, this iron accumulation. So it's probably part of a common dysregulation or stress response pathway or something that's not directly related specifically to this pathway. Although, again, I still feel like I can't say that's 100% certain because I'm not an expert in pecan or iron dysregulation. Um, but so what we're trying to do right here is this is missing in people. Like this is, this protein does not function properly in people with pecan. And so we can just put this back in here. We can try to start this whole pathway here. And if we can just replace, like put this back in, it should fix this. Is, is that more helpful? Yeah, because that's the difference between the gene therapy that you're working on, the CoAZ trial that's adding it downstream, mm -hmm. and the iron, uh, the ferroprone, which is dealing with the repercussions of the broken pathway. Yeah. So it's three different strategies to tackle one big problem. And they're not mutually exclusive. They are not. Yeah. So that, uh, like in many disorders, you could use two different approaches to try to fix the problem. So the gene therapy could be the only approach, for example, in very young patients who don't have much iron accumulation. In an older patient who does have iron accumulation, you can combine the therapy. True. So that's, that's, they're not mutually exclusive. And you can even see where, I mean, if we got real lucky and the COAZ was working very well, that was something you could put patients on <coughs> until they could get gene therapy, and that would help preserve the nerve function so that when we go in with the gene therapy, there's still stuff left to work with. So that would also, that would be <coughs> wonderful. So. I'm just going to give you the mic. <laughs> I'm sorry, but just one other point. This is actually a very important uh, point. Many clinical trials, you cannot be on two clinical trials at the same time. Mm. So one of the keys is for parents, but also the scientific and medical advisory board, to prioritize, potentially help prioritize what the appropriate initial step would be. And to be careful about <clears throat> trying to use uh, therapeutic trials that may not have as dramatic an effect as others. And so that's something that you as families, I think, really need to consider. Mm -hmm. well, Everybody starting, wants their child cured today. But are they all starting at the same time? You know, we're that's all, exactly as right. As families, I'm pretty it's sure all we're all going to go with the one that's available at the time mm -hmm. and then but, figure that out from there. And I but, know there's a washout between trials, but you're not going to tell half of us that have been waiting for years to, right. oh, sorry, mine's not done for two more years. you got to wait because it's a better therapy. No, we're going to try with the one that's there now. And I'm pretty sure everybody's with me on that. And, and the great thing about trying with the therapies that are available now is that we add to the body of knowledge that does that drug help? How much does it help? So when the next clinical trial comes on, we have more PCAN patients ready to do it. We can do washouts and get old patients in it too, and continue adding to the body of knowledge and just get this snowball going of, this drug works, get it to market so I can be on both at the same time. Get this one out of clinical trial and make it available. <clears throat> But could a potential clinical trial ex exclude you from being able to participate if you were, if you had participated in a dip in one, like for example, like my daughter had PBS, so so when they did the fair problem, she was able. So would that there be a potential that if you were on one, you may not be able to get it be on another? Okay. I don't know. I've never done a clinical trial, so. but so, uh, we could yeah. find out. I would imagine that. Actually, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. It is up mm -hmm. to the FDA yeah. regulators yeah, to so help yeah. navigate those situations. Yeah. So there could be, if we, if we tried the first one, we may not potentially be able to do the next one. Because right. But you yeah. also have to consider the pace of research. No, and I get that. No, I yeah. totally, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, me. I guess I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to put in a quick plug um, for the natural histories. We talked about that in the sessions the other day. Um, I understand that those are very burdensome for some people, but if you can participate in a natural history study, it's very important, especially for gene therapy trials, where we really don't want to do a double-blind placebo-controlled gene therapy trial, especially for rare diseases, and so frequently what we end up doing is having to compare success of that to a known natural history, and so if we don't have a known natural history for the course of the disease, the FDA does not like us to say, because you can't just put a gene therapy in and say, oh, hey, patient's better, it worked. You know, we need to be able to compare and show that it actually is working, especially for something that is 
you know, permanent and expensive, and you really want to make sure it's actually doing the thing you want it to do because you just put so much effort into it. So please, if you can, participate in those natural history studies. And a natural history is listed as a clinical trial, but it does not affect your participation in medication and replacement, like, like things that will help therapeutic clinical trials and natural history trials are two separate ball games and you can be in both at the same time. Sorry, I had to run to the deep end. So I guess if I'm not mistaken, the question is if you're registered in one clinical trial, can you actually try the other drug as well? We constantly discuss in our group meeting, um, I'm not the best person to answer that. Penny or Susan will give you a more clear answer, but yes, I think some part of it is within our hands, some part of it in the regulatory body's hand. All right. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I was just going to ask, the natural history study that so many of us have done for PCAN, uh, will that transfer to potentially um, to a gene therapy trial, or would it, the gene therapy as part of their FDA approval process have to sort of start over? No, the you could history? use the, the gene, the, the natural history study that people are doing now, uh, that would be something we could use in an application of the FDA. Okay. Yeah, as Susan always say, uh, this data will be shared with everybody. Development drop A, development drop B, um, gene therapy, we, it will be shared. So please register and whoever you did it, thank you so much. I know it's been a bag. I tried it myself too as a control subject. <laughs> it takes time and effort, I know. I'll also say that um, my only horse in this game is trying to you know, help everyone. So if you know, other disease, if other um, drugs come out that are working great for people and they decide they don't want to therapy, that's fine. I'll go work on a different disorder. So, you know, if, if it turns... <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I just hope that we're getting these therapies to people as fast as we can and helping them out. So um, I definitely would say that anything we can do to do that faster is what we're going to try to do. So. Okay. Oh, yeah. And let's say if you feel free to contact me if you have any more questions about gene therapy. Don't ask me about pecan specifically because I'm not going to be the best expert right now. Maybe in like a couple of years I could be like, oh yes, now I can speak authoritatively. But um, but if you do have questions or if you're like, oh wait, where did you where did you say those education things for on the website? Like there it is again. So please um, feel free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, was, do we need this? Is it done? Okay. <laughs> So I think I'm the last panel is a weird term, but I'm Sue. Um, most of you know me, some of you don't know me. I'm a PhD in neuroscience in Susan Hinflick's lab. I'm in charge of the research, meaning that I talk to Susan all the time for what do we do next? What can we make it better? What kind of marker we can develop to see how PCAN is progressing or <coughs> acting or just crazy happening. So um, I don't have a presentation today, but I'm open to question. Um, whatever you have in your mind, if I cannot answer it, I'll just put like Susan and Penny pictures or something behind me and like point there. But um, I have been studying brain iron for hmm, 12 years through my PhD program and postdoctoral training. And then I moved to Portland to work with Susan because I really wanted something that is applicable to human patients. And not only working with the mice and cells, but something that we get from you guys, analyze it, and something that is appli applicable back to the condition or the marker. Okay. Um, hi, Sue. I'm Trevor from Australia. Um, just wondering why um, a typical and classic how do the genes fall down to, to what determines A to be or a classic case in PCAM? I wish I had an answer for you. When I first started, I tried to group everything into two. Classical, atypical, mutation groups, mutation types, development of age, during the duration of the time, nothing fit. Remaining activity, no. So, uh, short answer is we don't know why one time progresses rapidly while the other uh, progress slowly, even if they have a similar 
mutation, or homozygous or heterozygous mutation. Susie, any clue? Um, actually, when we've uh, measured the activity of, uh, this was done years ago, when we measured the activity of uh, various uh, uh, PANK2 mutations, we actually measured them biochemically. Um, the most, uh, the early onset uh, uh, problems uh, were associated with proteins that didn't have any activity. And then the later onset or atypical were associated with proteins that had point mutations in various parts of the protein uh, that had only reduced activity, like uh, 70% uh, reduction, 50% reduction. So they were still active, but they just weren't as efficient at uh, doing their job. Thank you. Anything else? Yep. This might be a silly question, but we're doing here. There are no silly questions. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so with all the talk of therapies for all of these different, FPCAN seems to affect everybody so differently, and all of these clinical trials seem to be like a blanket, we're gonna fix it. How do you manage dosing if, if there's so many variables and there's atypical and classical and different levels of protein? Not everybody's gonna need the same dose, right? So how, how does that work? So I need to wear a penny hat right now. <laughs> This is a penny world. Um, for mice, we tried with different dose, and we see the difference of the marker change depending on the dose. We find the right one that fits to the uh, recovery level per se. Yes, humans are not the hairy small with the tail. Everyone is going to be different, and Penny is going to have um, some window of dose study as far as I know. And luckily, um, the very first chemical in the pathway, vitamin B5, has very, very large tolerance window. Even if we accidentally give a little too much or too little, it's not going to harm us as far as we know. So we ha we're lucky to have a big tolerance window for this chemical. And I believe it's mostly the same for the intermediates in the pathway, although we don't have solid data right now. And mice, even if we jacked up the dose to Sixfold, I tried, nothing happens to them. What will be effective? Uh, we'll have to measure the outcome, whether it's a chemical outcome or somebody slow down the progression. It will take some time to monitor, but it will be the um, outcome measurement to see the effective dose. The gene therapy or agnostic, we just give you a lot. <laughs> right, and by a lot, I mean like trillions of viruses. So. Um, that's one of the reasons we do those safety studies at first, just to make sure if we essentially overdose people that it doesn't cause any harm. Um, because it is difficult to control, uh, not even just like based on your genetic type of, if you're an atypical or classical or phenotypic, like what um, mutations you have in the gene therapy because people are individuals with different responses. Some people respond very well and others don't, and we can't predict that in the beginning. So we just kind of give everyone a lot. and make sure that in initial tests show that this won't, won't hurt them. And that's what um, usually the FDA requires, dose escalation studies, so that we can just kind of figure out what's the maximum dose we can give people to get a response. But yeah, we just give you like 10 trillion viruses. I'm not joking, it's like 10 trillion. <laughs> Question over. And she is confident it's safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would say it's very, it's I mean, I, I joke because it's it's something I can joke about because it is a lot. But um, like I said, the no one's had really severe reactions to the virus itself. As far Hi, as I know, it was a really good discussion on an uh, research and the importance of that for the FDA. Um, is there any thoughts around the timing for when that will be published? Because it's a critical point for drug development. I need a second penny hat. <laughs> um, sorry, I have no idea on that part. Our clinical team will know. But if I'm not mistaken, we've been up, what, three years so far? Three, four years? I think it might take longer than that, but that, oh, wow. Uh, hey, our clinical team is here. Mm -hmm. It's been running for four years. 
Do we have any clue when possibly it will be published? Um, I, I, I don't know, but I know the initial study was just in five years. So we're not even fully done with it yet. Yeah, it's the initial phase was meant to be five years. Yeah, I think it's probably going to be five years. Yeah, it's probably going to be five years. Yeah, it's probably going to be five years. Again, I'll just jump in and say that's why it's so important to start on those now because it takes so long to do. You can't, I can't apply for an FDA, you know, a new approval and, and they say, where's your natural history? I'm like, oh, we'll just get it in six months, no problem. Like, it takes a long time to do them. So it's good that you're doing it now. Okay, um, I think this is designed to be, when we're done, you guys are supposed to share within whatever that format will be. I, but we're open for more questions if you have, otherwise you can talk within yourselves, I believe. Thank you. Thank you.